good morning, church. Pleasure to have each and every one of you with us this morning. For those that don't know me, my name is Pastor Tim, and it's my great privilege to open up God's Word. Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. If you don't have a Bible but you have a device, you can scan that QR code whether in your bulletin or there on the screen. It'll take you exactly where we're going to be for the entirety of our time this morning. And we have been studying this book of 1 Corinthians since the beginning of the school year. And we've been doing so under the heading firing in all cylinders. And if you've been around a car, you no doubt know that a car needs to run on all of its cylinders. It needs to be firing just right or the car is going to have difficulty. It's not going to live out its purposes. It's going to create great discouragement on your part, the driver. And so it is with churches. Churches need to be firing on all cylinders. They need to be healthy. They need to be vibrant. They need to live out the purposes and the plans that God has for it. And when a church is out of alignment, when it's misfiring, it will be seen in a lot of its decisions and a lot of things that it uh, seeks to live out. Uh, the church that he's writing to is a church that was in first century Greece. You can still visit the area of Corinth today, uh, but the city was filled with all kinds of distractions from a worldly perspective. And as a result of that, the church was defined as carnal, not Christ-like. Instead of being holy followers of Jesus Christ, they were haughty, they were filled with arrogance. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, why do you boast so much? Why are you so arrogant when you are missing the mark in so many ways? What Paul's gonna do in 1 Corinthians, as we've learned, is he's gonna bring about course correction. And we're gonna see that that course correction at times for us can be difficult. None of us wanna hear critique. None of us ever wanna be corrected in the wrongs that we're doing. But what we're gonna see today is it comes from a real place of love and affection. What the Apostle Paul's gonna say in our text this morning is that this type of correction is necessary because he loves them so very much and he longs nothing but the best for him. So let's pick up uh, from uh, God's word where we left off last week. First Corinthians chapter four. We're gonna start in verse 14 and go through the end of the chapter. Here's what uh, our text this morning says. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. As I teach them everywhere in every church, some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with the love in a spirit of gentleness? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and I thank you for your word this morning and I ask now that you would teach us and train us. I pray we would receive what you have to say to us with humility and that we might know that while you communicate needed changes in our life, you do so from a place of love and a place of great desire for us to experience all that you have for us. So speak through me, Lord, I pray, and let my words be your words, and we do so for the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people said, amen. What Paul's gonna teach us this morning is that there are moments of truth in the lives of us as individuals. And in the text, this is a moment of truth. It's a moment of decision. It is a moment where we get to prove if we are equal to the task ahead of us. There's a lot of moments of truth in life. In fact, a moment of truth has been defined as a pivotal point where a decision or action reveals the person's true character, preparation, or abilities. It is no longer that words that matter, only actions that will show what is real. And testing that will tell us if you really have it within you. There's a lot of moments of truth in, in our lives. For the student, the moment of truth is exam day, when that test is placed on the desk, and it's just you and the questions and the answers. Will you rise to the occasion and meet the qualifications of passing the test? 
for the interviewer, the person that's seeking a job. It is that final interview where every question matters and every answer you give is going to be nuanced. Will you be able to communicate in such a way that they will hand you this new opportunity, this new venture, this new job? Uh, but it goes deeper than that. It, it doesn't just involve uh, uh, passing a test of sorts. Sometimes it's getting to a place where you just are all in. You're committed. For the couple, the moment of truth is that moment where he asks and she says yes, where all of the conversations and all of the different dates and all of the different connecting points that you've had up to this point now bring you to this one moment of truth. Will you call one another husband and wife for a lifetime? You see, moments of truth are pivotal. Moments of truth sometimes happen and it's just you in a classroom or it's you in an office or it's you and, and the person you love at, at some place asking a very important question. But there are other moments of truth that are seen by myriads of people. And it's in that moment of truth that it is in that moment you are going to prove whether you're equal to the task or not. In athletics, we talk about these moment of truths when the game is on the line. We talk about these moment of truths when you either win or you go home. It seemingly always is at the end of the game. It's seemingly always filled with pressure. And, and there's no better moment of truth than what happened on Friday night. Turn your attention to the screen. Now the kind of at bat that every kid that plays baseball dreams of one day having. You tell yourself, right, all right, bottom of the tent, bases loaded, World Series, one run game, Dodgers, Yankees. Reality for Freddie Freeman right here. Taylor the tying run, Edmund the winning run. Cortez delivers. Freeman hits the ball to right field. She is gone! Gibby, meet Freddy, game one of the World Series. How many watch that on Friday night, show of hands? How many don't care? Right? You know, it's hard to show baseball clips in October when the Chicago teams haven't played a meaningful game in three months. So stick with me. Why in the world would I show that? Because in that moment, for the pitcher and the batter, it wasn't enough for them to talk. Imagine for a moment, we're in the bottom of the 10th. We're extra innings. The bases are loaded. One team is ahead, and the last team is down to its final out. What if all they did was argue about who was better? What if he sat in the on-deck circle and, and volleyed, if you will, comments, man, I could hit anything you send my way, and the pitcher says, well, I could strike you out with any pitch, and they never actually get to it. What Paul is saying is, is at some point, friends, you and I need to get into the batter's box and prove that what we've learned in Christ actually means something. It has an impact and it enables us to do things that we couldn't do on our own. You see, there's a moment of truth and there's a moment of truth in this text because we are about to go into a set of landmines from chapter five on. This passage, or this book, gets very, very difficult in the days to come, and it's gonna challenge us. It's gonna challenge us about how we live our life. It's gonna challenge how we order our sexuality. It's gonna challenge how we order our marriages, how we deal with our spiritual gifts. It's gonna challenge when we disagree with people. It's gonna challenge us, and this moment of truth is you and I getting in the batter's box of 1 Corinthians chapter four and saying either I just talk a good game or I can do the things that God says that I can do. And we've gotta ask ourselves that question this morning because at the end of this passage, Paul says the kingdom of God is not talk. 
but it is power. It's transformative work that's going on in our lives. And so maybe your Christianity is that you've got enough information that you can be uh, at least well-versed enough to carry on a conversation about Jesus and his work in this world and his work in our lives. But does it go deeper than that? Paul wants to know, are you all talk? It would have done no value to the Dodgers for Freddie Freeman to say, I can hit a home run whenever I want. It doesn't matter what you say. The question is, when you get into the batter's box, will you do it? And Paul says in Corinth, there were all kinds of teachers who talked a good game, but weren't being transformed by the gospel. And as a result, they served as bad guides and leaders for the church. And so we've got to stop in this moment. And we've got to take stock. And we have to ask in this moment of truth, am I truly in for Christ and his kingdom or do I just sit along the peripheral? Do I hang around with enough sanctified words, enough religious information that makes me dangerous to make people around me think that I'm actually in a close and intimate walk with Jesus? And for some, you'll do that deep dive into your life and you'll be able to say, yeah, with all humility, I'm doing my best and I'm trying and God's grace be with you. But some will say that's too hard and it's too much. Or there's better things to invest and devote your time and attention to. And to that, I want you to hear that that is the wrong way to go. That is the wrong way to live your life. And I don't say that, as Paul says, to shame you, but to admonish you. You see, Paul's going to share some hard truths today. And he says, I want to admonish you. That word is an important word that he's going to communicate. It's the word nuthetio. And Paul writes nuthetio there in the Greek, and it means to warn, to instruct, to correct, or to bring about positive change. Now he's going to couch that word nuthetio with these familiar words like, you are my beloved children, and I am your father. And so there are these statements that begin to tell us that why he's doing this is because he loves. If you're a parent, you know at times you have to tell your children something they don't want to hear. And when you tell them that, you're not doing it because you don't like them. You don't do it because you hate them. Even if your children say, you're doing this because you don't like me, you're doing this because you hate me, that really why you're correcting is that you will grow them and make them better for their good and for the glory of God. Paul says, I want to admonish you, I want to nuthetio in your life here so that you will get better. Well, why do we need to get better? Because there's a moment of truth. There's a moment where we're going to stand and we're gonna have to give an account for what has transpired. Now, Paul's talked about that in recent verses. He said there's a day coming, and on that day will we be ready. The day when all of our works and all of our deeds and all of our commitments, will they make it through the fire? Will we have built our lives on the right things? And some talk a good game, but on that day, everything will be burned up. So Paul says, I don't want you just to talk it. I want you to live it, and I want you to build your life in a way that it is able to withstand the fire of judgment that is coming. To do that, he says there are three things we need to be a part of, and number one is we need to listen to the wisdom of the right guides. We need to listen to the wisdom of the right guides. Paul says, I write these things not to shame you, but to admonish you, and he says, as he goes on, he says that you have countless guides in Christ. But you do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. To understand what Paul is saying, we've got to get into the spirit of which he's saying. And you're like, well, how can we know that? All we have is the black and white of what he's communicated in words. And the answer is found in that word countless. Because I'm going to tell you that my understanding as I've studied this passage and as I've looked at what other great men and women have communicated about this passage, 
What I've come to realize is that word countless, he uses in a facetious way. And the reason why is the word countless literally means tens, thousands upon ten thousands, myriads upon myriads, more than you could ever ask for or imagine. So, so this is how he's writing this down. Though you have way more guides than you could ever imagine, though you have way more guides than you'll ever have use of, though you have countless guides, you see that word countless is used to describe three different things in the Bible. It describes the number of angels, myriads upon myriads of angels. It talks about the number of stars in the sky, and it talks about the sands of the seashore. They are countless. But when we say it, we don't say the, the sands of the seashore are countless or the stars are countless. We, we talk about them. There are so many we could never count them. There's so many we would exhaust all of our time and energy ever to think that we could imagine how many there are. What Paul is saying is, is you've got lots of people speaking into your life more than you'll ever need, more than you'll ever know what to do with. But what you need is a father. But before we get to the father, we gotta ask about the guides. The guides, there are some good guides. Paul has talked about them, Apollos. He's gonna talk about Timothy. He's gonna say himself as a positive guide. Notice in the text, he says uh, back in verse eight, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit that you may learn to not go beyond what is written that, you will, that none of you will be puffed up in favor of one or the other. So Paul says, listen, we're going to evaluate ourselves because we want you to know we're good guides. We want you to know we're trustworthy guides. He's gonna say that of Timothy in a moment, that he is faithful and he's reliable and you can trust him. But in Corinth, there were guides at every street corner. This is ancient Greece. This is where mythology is ruling the day. This is where Aristotle and Plato and, and, and the philosophers of the day and their schools of thought were, were in great number. Countless. You went to Greece and you could find anybody who could lead you to the life that you no doubt were looking for. There were countless guides, but there weren't fathers, people that cared for you. Now he makes a distinction. That word guides is the Greek word pedagogy. Pedagogy. And it's a word that our educators use when we talk about pedagogy or pedagogy, depending on what part of the country you're from. And pedagogy or pedagogy is the study or the process of a teacher educating or instructing a student. And it comes from this Greek word pedagogy, which was a tutor. So in first century Corinth, your parents would bring in a tutor who would teach you arithmetic, who would teach you reading, who would teach you the social sciences, who would teach you philosophy or even theology. And their job was to make you well-versed in a particular area. And the difference was is they weren't your parents. They got paid to do a job. And some were really good at it, and some were miserable at it. What Paul is communicating is, is that in our world, as was in modern, I'm sorry, in ancient Greece, is true in modern day, and that is there are many guides out there. There are many tutors out there. This week, each of us inundated our lives with guides. We did so through the many media outlets that we listen to and read and, and take in. And so there are some who had their lives inundated with the political guides of our day. And my goodness, there's much to talk about. We're right on the heels of, uh, of, of election day. And so there's a lot we can talk about. Still others have, have inundated themselves with the guides of, of sports. And so we're talking about what we just watched and we're talking about the Bears game and there's much to talk about and that's what's gonna bring us joy by following our team. 
There are others that are following guides of health or, or fitness, and we're, we're tuning into that, or we're tuning into worldly distractions of every stripe and everything imaginable. And none of them, listen, are altogether bad. But what Paul's saying is, is that they're one in a million. What the Christian needs is something more than a pedagogy. Even a good pedagogy is a sad substitute for a father. And so he says, you have countless guides, you have countless pedagogies all around you. And the question is, who are you listening to? And so that's a great question for us this morning, and it's a question that I want you to ask of yourself, not anyone else, but in this last week, were you inundated with countless guides? or with fathers and mothers who pointed you to the gospel? Did you fill your life with the things of this world? Or did you pick up the book and ask, what does my Father in heaven desire, require of, delight in me doing? And sadly, like the Corinthian church, I think if we're really honest, we spent very little time in this book or in prayer, and we devoted a lot of time to the guides of the world. And we have countless ones we can go after, and Paul is jealous, and he says, what wisdom are you listening to? Is it the earthly wisdom that makes you number one? You see, a lot of guides will tell you you're the most important person. And that's why you need to take care of yourself. And that's why you need to better yourself. And that's why you need to do this thing or this procedure or this system because it will make you better and it will make you more uh, profitable and make you richer or make you healthier. And all those things might be good in and of themselves, but they are not what God wants. It is not the heavenly or godly wisdom that God wants for you. So he doesn't say this to say, you dumb people, why do you follow these guides? He does so because he knows and recognizes those guides will never fulfill or fill you up like how your heavenly father wants to pour into you his love and affection. And so Paul says, you gotta choose who are you going to follow. And once you make that decision, he says, I hope your decision will be to follow Christ. Well, how do we follow Christ? Notice we've gotta to learn to walk like Jesus. We gotta learn to walk like Jesus. So Paul says, notice in the text, I urge you then to be imitators of me. Why? Because he says, I am your father. I was there for you. Notice in verse uh, 16, uh, I'm sorry, verse 15, I've become your father in Christ through the gospel. So he's not just a tutor. He's one that's been there since the beginning. And he says, I watched you come to know Jesus. I saw the life-transforming power of Jesus in your life. And I wanna see that continue to live out. I wanna see that mature in your life. And so he says this, I want you to imitate me. That word imitate is the Greek word that Paul uses, mimeomai. And mimeomai is where we get the word mimic from. It is to mimic someone, to follow them closely, to model oneself. And what we need to know and recognize is what Paul is doing is not self-aggrandizing, it isn't boastful, it is the way Christianity works. You see, we don't have the luxury of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in, in Acts chapter nine comes face to face with Jesus. He hears audibly from Jesus. We don't have that luxury that the Apostle Paul or the disciples had. Eyewitnesses, John says in 1 John, we saw him, we touched him, we lived with him, we beheld him. We don't have that luxury as followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says in John 17 that we're even more blessed because we believed without seeing, without touching, without feeling. But how did we get there? And the answer is, that we saw life transforming power lived out in someone else. 
And so you came to know Christ because you saw someone else who was a Christian living out that kingdom power and you said, I want some of that. You saw it from mom and dad. You saw it from a sibling. You saw it from a neighbor, a friend. You saw it from a pastor. You saw it from someone working in the church, volunteering, a youth leader. And you saw it, and you heard their talk, but talk isn't good enough. You saw that kingdom power in their life. And you said there's something different about them about what they're saying, about the passion in which they're saying it, that I want that. And so you take what they say and you follow them. And so you say, well, how do I get to Jesus? And the person says, you ask Jesus into your life. You, you commit yourself to following and walking with Jesus. Well, how do I do that? And right away your question is, well, how do you do that? Well, I study his word, and I pray, and I get myself around other believers, and, and I put on the mind of Christ, and I allow myself to be filled by the Holy Spirit, and I live out the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, and I do this to the best of my ability. Will you do it perfectly? No. But I strive, and I discipline myself, and I run the race with perseverance. Well, how do you run the race? Well, follow me. Jesus did it with his disciples and his disciples did it with their disciples and Paul does it now with the Corinthian church but notice there's a middleman and the middleman is important because if there was no middleman then you'd be able to say Tim that sounds great but I'm not the apostle Paul and you would have been right but notice in the text Paul says I can't be there and so I'm going to send Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways. Now, if he had stopped there, I would have had a problem. But notice he says, my ways in Christ. He says in verse uh, 17, I teach them everywhere in every church. So Paul says, I'm gonna send Timothy, a young man, a disciple of his, he says he's a spiritual son, and he is going to teach you and train you, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna create this chain that takes us from Jesus to the disciples, to the apostle Paul, to Timothy, to the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, to those that they disciple, to those they disciple, to those they will disciple, to those ad nauseum, ad infinitum, and we get to you and I. You see, we could have not been followers of Jesus Christ unless someone had followed Jesus before us. So what this means is you're one of really, I said in the last service too, I think it's better to say one of three people. One, you are Paul, who is at a place of such maturity that your job is to teach and to train others. The second person is, is that you are Timothy, and you are in the process of being discipled, because Paul wasn't done with Timothy, but he's at such a place that he can now take under his wing others. So he's being discipled and discipling at the same time. And then the third group of people are the Corinthians who are not ready yet to be disciplers. And so they are in the process of learning how to walk, learning how to talk, learning how to live. So let me ask you this morning, in that continuum, where are you? Now, right away, I think many will say, well, I'm like the Corinthians. I haven't been fully taught. I haven't been fully trained. And I want to remind you what Paul says and what James says. Uh, by now, most of you should be teachers. By now, most of you should be disciplers. But because you've allowed the distractions of the world, 
because you have allowed other things into your life, because you have not seen fit to make the cause of Christ your number one priority, you're still, and just to put it into context, you're still drinking milk of chapter three and not eating solid food. You still need someone to nurse you. And that's not a good thing. For those that are brand new to the faith, that's absolutely acceptable. For you who have been in the faith five, 10, 15, 20 years, it's altogether unacceptable. It doesn't work. Which then gets me to the point for all those who have been followers of Jesus Christ for some years now, let me ask you this question. It's the question that Paul had to ask himself. It's the question Timothy had to ask of himself. And it's a question each of us has to ask of ourselves who have walked with the Lord for a long time. Do I have enough of a faith that someone can mimic me and it gets them closer to Jesus? Is there enough in my spirituality for someone to follow me and to become well-versed and well-trained and more like Jesus. Listen, in my other job, I'm a caterer. You give me a couple catering jobs and I can make you a caterer as well. I'm well-versed enough, I know the ins and outs of my trade that I can teach you relatively quickly how to think like a caterer, how to act like a caterer, how to serve and plan like a caterer, I can do that. And I would imagine in your occupation you could do the same thing. But what about spiritually? Do you have what it takes? Do you have all that is necessary? Have you done the requisite things that a child of God ought to do to grow in maturity so if someone follows after you, they can have some level of confidence that by following you, I'm getting closer to Jesus. And if there's any pause in your heart or mind, it means that maybe some work needs to be done. Some challenges to your own life need to take place. Or you need a spiritual father or mother that can call those things out. So what Paul says is you need someone who loves you, who will admonish you, who will grow you, and will seek to make you better. I'll tell you what, this is what makes being the pastor of Village Bible Church such a joy because the people of God say, we don't want guides who just make us feel good. We want spiritual fathers to come and to bring God's word to us, even the hard stuff, because we want to grow. And so as a father, I, I say to all of you, I admonish you not to shame you, but to make you better, that if someone can't follow you and get closer to Jesus, it isn't a problem that you have with other people, it's a problem you have with your Savior. And dig into that. Stop building your life on things that are not going to make it into eternity and start building with the gold and silver and precious stones so that you may teach and train others. Jesus talked about this. When a student is fully taught, he becomes like his, help me, his teacher, his master. In Acts, we see the, the unlearned, untrained, if you will, from a uh, worldly perspective disciples and they're corralled into this meeting with the Sanhedrin the religious elite of the day we talk about the disciples no collar and the Sanhedrin the white collar religious establishment and they start having conversations and the only thing that they can walk away from the religious elite can walk away from their time with the disciples is this truth we know they've been with Jesus if someone was to walk with you in your daily activities of life, in the comings and goings of life, would they know that they got closer to Jesus just by walking with you? Brothers and sisters, if you can't again in the affirmative, something is wrong with your relationship. And it doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you're without hope. What it means is this is a moment of truth. Are you going to do the difficult things to become the spiritual fathers and mothers that this place needs, that the world needs? Imagine a church where there are only two types of people, 
spiritual mentors and spiritual mentees. And they're working in correspondence with one another. Paul talks about this again and again in the New Testament when he writes to churches and says, older men teach younger men. Older women teach younger women. We wonder why the generation that's up and coming right now is so lost and so broken and so in need of answers. And the reason is, is because the generation above them are so distracted by other things that we don't care about their spiritual well-being. So we leave them to their own devices. We wonder why they do the things they do. And we wonder why their identities are a mess. And we wonder why they want to do massive changes to their bodies. And we wonder why they pursue the things they do. And the answer is they have no one to show them the way. And so they turn to TikTok and Snapchat and other vehicles of social media looking for anyone. And they'll take whatever guide they can get. And what they need is a spiritual father and mother to point them to Jesus and say, in Jesus, your questions will be answered. In Jesus, your identity will be sealed. In Jesus, you'll find the abundant life that this world seemingly tries to find like the blind leading the blind. But we have the truth. And will we get into this book and will we get into the life of Jesus and follow him so that others may follow us? Now listen, and I gotta move on to a very third, third very short point, and that is this. It is not the perfect that need only apply. Paul is not saying, I'm perfect, therefore follow me. But what he's saying is, is let me remind you of what Christ has told us. And the only thing that's required of us is what was required of Timothy, that he be faithful. Next week, next Friday, we're going to, or this Friday, we're gonna send off 140, 150 kids to fall camp. And they're gonna have a lot of fun, but what has been seen over the many years is a real spiritual high point in so many of our young people's lives. Now listen, we don't send them by themselves. Oh, imagine, okay? We're sending some 50 spiritual fathers and mothers with them. Men and women that are dedicating a a weekend off to pouring into young people and reminding them what Christ tells us about how to live the abundant life that he's called us to live. So we can do this, and it's being done in our church, but it's being done by only a few. And if we're gonna be a church that's about the power of God's kingdom and not just talk, it demands that we step up and mature in Christ and follow him so that others may mimic what we're doing and in doing so that they get closer to Jesus as a result. Now some right away will hear this, as they did in the first century, and they'll scoff at it. And they'll say, why do we even need to talk about this? Notice Paul says, I know that when I write these things, there are some who are arrogant and don't think that I'm going to come to you, that it really matters anything. What is it really gonna matter? Paul's not here, what's he gonna do? And he says, but I'm gonna come, and when I come, I wanna see not what you have to say, but what you have to show in Christ. And it begs the question this morning, will we live in kingdom power, or will we live just talking a good game? So let me ask you, and again, I'm talking to the people that have been following Jesus for some years now, If someone was to ask you, where have you seen the power of God in your life or around you, will you have to talk about someone else's experience or can you talk about your own? Can you say, I have been gripped by the greatness of God's grace and I've experienced it 
And I know what it's like to have Jesus with you in the good times and have Jesus with you in the difficult times. I know what it's like to sin grievously against the Lord and experience the loving kindness and the amazing grace of Jesus. I have experienced his forgiveness. I've experienced his goodness. I've experienced him in times of plenty and I've experienced him in times of lack. And what I've come to know is I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I know that. And I'm compelled because I've experienced that and known that, that I'm compelled to show others that because I am a blind man and I am a beggar man who is now looking to find bread and I have found it and now I want everybody else to find it as well. You see, you won't have that kingdom power unless you've experienced it yourself. Corinth was filled with great orators and people with great rhetoric, but they had not experienced God. And it's in this moment that we ought to pause and we ought to ask ourselves, is God's kingdom and its power, is it at work in my life? Or do I have enough knowledge and enough Christian platitudes that I can fake my way through this? Or have I been truly gripped by that power of God's kingdom in my life and that there's no greater joy now to share that with others? Paul says that when we do that, we will experience his power. And we'll experience it in our lives, we'll experience it in our church, and it will become a contagious thing because that is truly what our world is looking for. That kind of power in the hearts and minds of people is what our communities, what our nations, what this world is looking for. And if we would allow it to captivate us, what it could do to captivate the world, amen?